Let the people of the Lord give Him praise in this house and give Him their worship. Come on, give God all the praise and glory this morning. Praise God. Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Before I read, though, would you greet a couple people around you, welcome them to God's house and bless them this morning? As you find your way back to your spot, praise be to the name of Jesus. It is a blessing to be in God's house today as we worship Him and remember today that at the cross He does beckon us. He is the reason why we can have hope in the future and this morning we're going to walk in that hope with the hope of being equipped in God's Word. I want to begin today's message by reading from Genesis chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 just to get us started it says the Lord said to Cain why are you angry and why has your face fallen if you do well will you not be accepted and if you do not do well sin is crouching at the door its desire is contrary to you but you must rule over it will you join me in prayer this morning as we seek to understand God's truth father as we gather in your house today Father, would you help us to understand today how to rule over sin with your power? Would you help us today to discover you in ways that we have not yet understood? Would you help each and every one of us to give you our best today? To worship you, to praise you, to be equipped by your truth and by your word. Lord, would you take over the next few moments? Would you help us to pay attention to what your word has to teach us? Would you help each and every one of us to depart after the service with the joy of the Lord in our hearts, with the understanding of your truth in our minds and our hearts, to become vessels of your glory, Lord. Be glorified in this room today. Let each and every one of us experience you in a deep and an individually satisfying way because you alone can satisfy us. God, we praise you. In your holy and precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Awesome. Hey, I'm so glad you are here. First, open your Bibles if you have them, okay, to the book of Genesis. We're going to go verses 1 through 16, Genesis chapter 4 today. We're going to cover as much as we can, and we have a lot to cover. But if you don't have a Bible, make sure your hands are up. Let our ushers see you to bring you a copy. And please, please, please make sure you silence your devi digital devices so they don't ring in the middle of the service. Today, what I am going to share with you from God's Word is about how often we become half-hearted in our sense of worship and we don't give our best to the Lord. And I do want to start with this because I want, to, I want to ask you today if you're excited about God's Word because I want you to commit to being excited this morning, okay? Because in a few moments, you may not be so excited. So let me take, let me take your excitement now and make sure you commit to it. Is there anybody excited about God's Word in this house today? <laughs> All right. Now, remember... You're committed to it, okay? Remember, you're committed to being excited about God's Word. But let me start with this. Uh, it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, God's Word says, Whatever you do, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, do it heartily as you're doing it for the Lord. Because you are not serving other people, you are serving Jesus. So I want to ask you the self-examination question of the day as we get started. I want you to ask yourself this, am I offering the Lord my best? Are you giving God the best of what you have to give to Him? Is, today, is this moment as you're sitting in this house worshiping Him, is this the best of the worship that you could offer Him? Is this the best of attitude that you could give Him? Is this the best that you have to give to the Lord? And I want you to examine that today as we go through this message. Because what I'm going to share with you today is from this passage, seven lessons that teach us how a half-hearted worship is so dangerous. 
And I want to tell you this too, that the message may seem as though I am trying to discourage you or cause guilt in your heart, but my focus is rather different. I hope that you don't feel guilty, but rather you have a turning point in your life where you can say, you know what? God is giving me a second chance. We're going to see in the story of Cain that God is, God is a God who gives second chances. And God is going to give us a second chance to turn away from our shameful ways, from the ways we don't worship Him. So this message is mainly for those who are believers in Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. If you don't believe in Jesus, I'm still glad you're here. You may still learn something from it, but I want to mainly focus on those who believe in Jesus. Now, at the end of it, we're going to prepare ourselves to take communion. So if you don't have your elements, make sure you get ready for that too. But let me start with this uh, as we go. Before I read God's Word, let me tell you this. Uh, did you know that 9 out of 10 children that grow up in the church, when they reach the age of maturity, they actually leave the church. 9 out of 10 leave the church and leave the relationship with God. And many of them, so many of them have fall into many d different problems in life. Some of them, some of them give into pornography and many other sexual ways that devastate their lives for the rest of their lives. Some of them fall into addictions and so many other problems. And I have often wondered as to why it is that so many who grew up in the church would actually walk away from God. Why is it that they would walk away from the presence of God? And I believe that God gave me the answer through this passage. It's because surveys say, that 73% of these young people who left the church, when they were questioned as to why they left the church, their answers often came to one particular thing. 73% of them said that they left the church because of people-related issues, because the people that they saw in the church worship God were hypocrites. They were half-hearted worshipers, and they didn't want to be like that. In other words, what we have done is we have done a really good job over the course of time pretending to be good worshipers, and our legacy that we have left is a half-hearted worship. I hope that is not true for many of us. And I hope that today God speaks to you through this message to encourage you to turn away if you have a half-hearted worship. So I want to jump into God's Word. Are you still excited about God's Word? Yeah. Okay. Are you sure? Because I'm telling you, thank you. Thank you for the five of you who are clapping. I, I, I hope that God speaks to you through this. I want to start with verse 1 in chapter 4. Before I read this, at this point, Adam and Eve have been kicked out from the Garden of Eden because they are paying the consequence of their sin. And our story, though, continues, and it says in verse 1, chapter 4, it says, Now Adam knew his wife. Let me keep the verse on the screen for a moment. Adam knew his wife. Now, I could preach on this for a whole day. Because this is more than just a sexual relationship. This is the way God created and designed marriage for us to become intimate. But I don't have the focus or the time at the moment for this. Maybe someday we'll come back to this concept. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore, help me out with this, bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother, help me out, Abel. Now Abel, important details, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. And Cain, a worker of the ground. Let me pause right here. So Adam and Eve have two sons. We don't know the span of time that took between the two of them. Whether it was six months, or hopefully not six months, whether it was nine months, or, or whether it was uh, a year, two years. That was a guy speaking, by the way, okay? <laughs> whether it was ten years. We don't really know how long it took between the span of time that they, two, the two sons were born. But we are given this detail that she bore a son named him Cain, which I want to give you a possible definition of the word Cain. The word Cain possibly could mean gotten, okay? Gotten. So she says, I have gotten a man by the help of the Lord. Now, it's a possible definition. What is interesting is that, mo this is what my perspective is, that she names him Cain saying, God help me get a son. Because she's remembering the promise of, or the, 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 the curse that God gave to Satan, that the offspring of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent or Satan. And she is most likely thinking, here's the promise of God being fulfilled, that my offspring is going to bruise the head of the serpent. Little does she know that Cain is more wicked than they were. And spoiler alert, if you haven't read your Bibles, he's about to kill his brother. Okay, spoiler alert. Now, Abel, on the other hand, Abel can translate to, to three things. It could mean breath, vapor, or vanity. And what is interesting to me is I can't help but think that Adam and Eve, without knowing they are prophesying the destiny of their son, whose life is about to be a vapor, 
taken in vanity. And from this point forward, we will see that the life of humanity is nothing but a vapor. That's why we have to focus on eternal things. Because we are here for a moment and then gone the next moment. That's why we need to do something that leaves a legacy behind instead of doing things that don't matter or make no significance or no, nothing that we leave nothing behind. So are you still with me? So they have two sons. One keeps the ground, okay? One is a shepherd taking care of the flock. Now verse, four, verse 3 says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord, important, an offering, help me out, of the fruit of the ground. Now hold on to this. Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. Verse 4, And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. I'm going to pause right here. We'll read the rest, rest of verse 5 in a moment. So both of them brought an offering to the Lord. Yet what happened? One was accepted. One was not accepted. And you may ask, what just happened here? First, let me clarify this. The fact that they bring an offering is an act of worship. Both of them represent an offering to the, to the Lord, to the God of their, make, the God, their maker, and they bring it before him. Both of them offer it, not because they're asked. At least we are not given any inclination that anywhere God said, thou shall give me an offering. Nowhere do we see this being, being forced upon them, but each one of them chooses to bring an offering as an act of worship before the Lord. Cain brings of the fruits of the ground. Abel brings the firstborn of his flock and fat portions. Both of them bring an offering of worship. Cain brings fruits. Abel brings first fruits. That's important. Important. Now, I want to give you today, as we go through this, I want to give you seven lessons that I help you, I hope they help you examine whether your worship is half hearted or it's not. And in a moment, we're going to see that Cain's offering was rejected because his heart was not fully there. His worship was half-hearted. That's why God did not give him regard for what he brought before the Lord. Lesson number one is what I want you to write down if you're note-takers. A half-hearted worship is linked to its giver's attitude and heart. The reason, the reason why we offer to God something that our heart is not in it is because that's what we think about God. We don't think of Him the way we should think of Him. We don't honor Him the way we should honor Him. We don't worship Him the way we should worship Him. The reason why our offerings sometimes may not be accepted, just like Cain's was not accepted or honored by God, is because our worship is half-hearted. And it's crazy to me because I, I, you, can, you can see this for yourselves over the course of time, what has happened to the church and how the church has deviated from speaking what the truth is. And we have turned our worship to half-heartedness. It's about me feeling good about myself. It's about me giving what I want to give. There is so much more to us being created to rule over sin. There's so much more to us being created to worship a God of all the heavens and the earth. There's so much more to us. So is your worship half-hearted? Because if it is half-hearted, your half-hearted worship also represents what you offer to the Lord and how you offer it to Him. Now, the problem with what I'm saying is so many of us look at it and say, well, it's financial. He's talking about positions and belongings and what I own. No, there is so much more to offering the Lord the best that you have. In fact, here's the crazy thing. We have become so arrogant, so arrogant to think, for some of us, we think, I don't even need to give my sins to the Lord anymore. Because he doesn't, he doesn't need to have my sins. And you're going to see the same thing happen with Cain, that he doesn't even have remorse for his sins as we go through it. The problem with so many of us is that we say, I don't want to give my sins even to God. I don't, want him, I don't want to honor Him with who He is and how He can forgive my sins. So we just walk with Him, we think, without having a full or a wholehearted sense of worship. Are you still with me? Because yeah. I haven't even started yet, okay? <laughs> so one of their offering is accepted. The other one is not. God does not have regard for it. Now, the second part of verse 5 says... So Cain was very, help me out with this. Angry. Let's try this one more time. So Cain was very, Angry. and his face fell. fell. Now, did you notice what just happened? God has regard for Abel's offering, but not for Cain. Unlike his parents, Adam and Eve, when they knew that God was upset with them in the garden as they had eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when they hid themselves, Cain actually stands right there angry with God and with his brother. 
And his face is sorrowful. His face is down. He's actually angry with God that God has not accepted. Instead of hiding from the presence of God that his, his sin is visible. And I'm going to show you that it is actually his sin in a moment. But if you're note takers, I want you to write lesson number two down. A half-hearted worship. A half-hearted worship, worship fosters anger. A half-hearted worship and offering fosters anger. The reason why so many of us are angry, and if you deal with anger issues, the reason why so many of us are angry is because we have a half-hearted sense of worship. The reason why you have issues with anger is because you most likely have not given God the best of your worship. You have not accepted God to be your king, to give Him everything that you are, to offer Him everything that you are, so we get angry. We deal with anger issues, and I know there's people here that you may have anger issues right now, and I'm trying to encourage you today. The reason why we get angry is because we are not giving God our best of worship, our best of offering. That's why we get angry. Now, there's a beautiful verse in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20. It says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisper or no whisperer, quarreling ceases. Did you notice what it says? It says, where there is no wood, fire will go out. If you put fire in your anger, it's going to keep burning. But if you give that wood of your fire to the Lord, the fire of your anger will actually cease to exist. Lesson number three, if you're note takers, a half-hearted worship produces dejection and other negative feelings. As I say this, some people may roll their eyes because if you have been raised in church for a long time, okay, we have been taught that negative feelings, emotions are things we should not talk about. We don't talk about feelings. We don't talk about emotions. But yet God created you with emotions. God created you with feelings. And think about this for a moment. A lot of our sins that you and I commit, a lot of our sins are connected to how negative emotions flow out of us. So your negative emotions and feelings are greatly correlated with how you're offering to the Lord your best of worship. In fact, let me give you some examples of this. Anger leads to murder. We're going to see that in a moment. Hatred and abuse. Fear leads to abandonment, alienation, and rejection. Emotional pain leads to hurting others. You have heard the statement, hurt people, hurt people. Jealousy leads to betrayal, discontentment, sadness leads to seeking comfort in wrong places such as sexuality, bad relationships, addictions, drug, alcohol, and so forth. Disappointment leads to resentment, and the list grows on, meaning that all of your negative feelings are greatly correlated with what you are not giving to the Lord. Because here's what the Scripture teaches us, that when we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, He gives us His Holy Spirit. And as we walk with the Lord, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are very, very real and, and opposite of every negative emotion that we have. Many of you have memorized these verses in Galatians chapter 5, 20 to 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, meaning God's qualities that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost gives to us are the opposite of our negative feelings of dejection and all sort of different negative feelings that we have. So the reason why we have these feelings is because we are not offering to the Lord our best. The reason why we have no self-control, the reason why we have anger issues, the reason why we feel rejected, the reason why we feel all these things is because we are not offering to the Lord our best. Are you still with me? Yeah. Verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? Why are you, in other words, standing before me angry? Verse 7, if, watch, this is important detail. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you or it is for you, but you must rule over it, meaning that you and I were created to rule over sin with the power and the help of God. But I want you to notice this detail. God looks at Cain and says, why are you angry? Why, are you, why is your face down? Why do you feel dejection? Why are, you angry when, why, why are you angry with me when your offering was not good? Why are you angry with your brother when your offering wasn't? Why are you blaming me and your brother for your sense, your inability to offer to me your best? And how do I know that his offering was not good? Because God gives us a clue. He says, if you do well, meaning that he didn't do well. And he says, if you do well, great, you will be accepted. If you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. 
trying to, to consume you, trying to rule over you, meaning that you and I were created not to be ruled by sin. And here's what I want you to write down if you're note takers. Lesson number four, a half-hearted worship displays a heart ruled by sin. These are not profound lessons I'm giving you. A half-hearted worship displays where, who, who is ruling your heart, who is governing your heart. Now, let me give you some examples of this. If I'll give you some examples of this. If you're one of those people who is always, always negative and asking questions with, why God? Why, why are you doing this to me? You're a person whose heart is ruled by sin. If you, got, if you give to God financially, per se, okay? If you give to God financially, by the way, I think it is important that we all give to God financially. That's because then we are learning not to be ruled by finances. But if you give to God financially so that others would see, oh, I am putting an offering in. So they would praise you for it. Or you're doing it because you feel obligated to do so. Your heart is ruled by sin. If you serve in the church so that people would look at you and say, man, isn't he amazing? Your heart is ruled by sin. Your worship is half-hearted. If you're one of those people who sits in the service and you're praising and raising your hands and you're acting like you're all holy, but inwardly you know your worship and focus is not really on God. You know it. We don't know it. So you're doing it so people would say, my goodness, isn't she holy? You are ruled by sin. Your worship is half-hearted. And it's not honorable to the Lord. Jesus says, Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a what? Slave to sin. Every one of us who are ruled by sin, we are a slave to sin. What that means is that to rule over sin necessitates a wholehearted sense of worship, a wholehearted attitude toward what we can bring to the Lord. Now, verse 8 and 9, watch this. It says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Now, pay attention to this part. Are you with me for a moment? Yes. Are, are you sure? Yes. Okay. Verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? First, he murders his brother. Why? Because his heart is ruled by sin. First, he murders his brother. Second, he lies to God. I don't know. Third, he argues with God. Am I my brother's keeper? This is a condition that many of us deal with when our worship is half-hearted, not wholehearted. In fact, I want you to write down lesson number five if you're a note-taker. Uh, not a profound lesson, again. A half-hearted worship leads to arguing with God. Meaning that if you're always one of those people who, who looks at your situation and you're always arguing with God, why am I going through this in my life? If you're always arguing with God and you're dis if you find yourself in disagreement with God all the time, what I mean, God says, hey, this is a sin. No, I don't agree that's a sin. You're a half-hearted worshiper. If you're looking through the scripture, okay, say, you know what, I may have committed this thing and so-and-so says it's a sin and the Bible may have referred to it as a sinful action, but let me show you it's not. And you go through the Bible to prove that you are not sinful. You are arguing with the Lord. If God said it's a sin, it's a sin. If you're constantly going through the scripture saying, you know what, let me justify my sin. And you're constantly trying to justify what you have done. Am I my brother's keeper? Your heart is ruled not only by sin, but you are constantly disputing with what God said to be sinful. And that is a sign of a bad heart, a half-hearted worship. So if God is telling you you're committing sins, try to see how I can turn away from that. How can I come to the Lord with an attitude that is contrary to what I want to have? Proverbs chapter 21 verse 30 says, No wisdom no understanding, and no counsel will prevail against the Lord. And I want to tell you this. I know you know this already, but talking back to God and talking a smack to God never works out. Okay? Some of you as children remember that when you talk smack to your parents and you felt the wrath of your parents. I hope you did because the punishment of sin needs to be consequences. Otherwise, we will never learn. Verse 10 it says, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. I love this verse, side note, because to me it's a reminder that there's still life after death. Within the first verses in the Bible that we are reminded that there's life after death. 
Verse 11, and now, verse 11, God gives him consequences of his actions, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on earth. Cain said to the Lord, this is so important. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. I know some of you are wondering about the question, who's going to kill him? That's for next week. We're going to talk about that. Okay, don't, don't, get, don't let your focus be changed. What I want you to see right here, this is so significant. What I want you to see is that God is giving Cain the consequences of his sin. But instead of putting his face down in shame like his parents did when they knew they had sinned, they hid themselves because they knew they had sinned. Instead of doing that, he stands before the presence of God, still angry, and he says, this is too great for me to bear. What are you doing? Because there's no remorse in the heart of Cain. And here's what I want you to write down if you're note takers. Half-hearted worship impedes the power of remorse. One of the other things that the new, new generation of church is teaching us is the lack of conviction. There are times where churches are teaching us, you know what, you shouldn't feel guilty, you shouldn't feel remorse in your heart, you should always go to church and feel good about yourself. I am telling you, that is not the truth, because what the Holy Spirit does, He purifies, and purification process requires some pain, requires some conviction, requires us to be cleansed, and cleansing hurts. And if you come to church and never have remorse, if you read God's Word and you never have remorse in your heart, that means you're not experiencing conviction. So it either means two things, it either means you're perfect, which I highly doubt it, or it means you are really half-hearted in your worship. Which one are you? Except when you are wholeheartedly worshiping God, you experience remorse. That's why it says in James chapter 9, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, it says, Lament and mourn and, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Meaning when God is speaking to you, saying, here's the consequence of your actions, you don't say, God, this is too great. Why are you doing this to me? Instead, you say, God, I'm sorry. I messed up. Are you still with me? I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I promise you. Verse 15. Verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Again, two things that come to people's mind as they read this verse. One, who would kill him? Hold on to that question until next week, okay? Question number two is, what is the mark that people put, or God put on Cain? Do you want to hear my profound answer to that question? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it looked like, what kind of a mark it was. The point of it is that God said, you murdered and you're guilty for punishment. But even though you murdered and you're guilty and you deserve death, I am giving you a second chance to live a righteous life. So a mark that God puts on him is a reminder that he cannot be killed and everyone who would kill him would receive a sevenfold punishment. It's a reminder that sin's wages is always death. Now, I'm going to finish in a moment with this. I want to give you the last lesson and then read the last verse for today. The last lesson I want you to write down is important yet not profound still. It's profound in what it can do to you. A half-hearted worship leads to spiritual alienation. The reason why so many of us feel as though we are separated from God, why they feel rejected, is because our worship is half-hearted. Look at verse 16. It says, I think this is one of the saddest verses in Genesis. It says, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. I know some of you read this, so what's the big deal? He just went away to a different direction. No, 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 listen. He actually went away from the presence of the Lord. And he would say, how do you know that? Read the rest of chapter 4. It will tell you that Cain's descendants all follow in his footsteps. And then you get to chapter 6, 7. You see all the descendants of Cain die in the flood. Because Cain actually walked away from the presence of the Lord. And the thing about it is, 
the last, this is the last time you hear about Cain until you get to the New Testament and then you get to the book of 1 John or Hebrews or Jude, and the only times you hear about the destiny of Cain is negative, God telling you, such as 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. We should not be like Cain. Now, I want to finish with this. I, I can't help myself but wonder, what if in that moment, in the last few moments where Cain murdered his brother, after murdering his brother, he argued with God, and after arguing with God, he, God gave him the consequences of his sin. Even after all of that, what if when God was giving the consequences to him, what if Cain had said, God, I messed up? What if Cain had said that instead of saying, this is too severe for me? Would God have not only forgiven him, but given him a second chance for his legacy to change? Would God change his legacy? I believe with all of my heart he would. Why do I know that? Because the scripture gives us example of that. And let me give you one example. His name is King David. And not only did he do similar things as Cain did, you know the story if you have read your Bibles. King David slept with Bathsheba, another man's wife, and then had, his, had her husband murdered. Then God had to send a prophet named Nathan to him. And Nathan came and said, hey, David, do you know what you have done? And when David understood what he had done, he wrote Psalm 51. And I want to read a portion of Psalm 51 for you. Because it represents a heart of remorse. And if you would have put bookmark in Psalm 51, maybe you can read it later, but it begins. The, I don't have it on the screen, but verse 1 says, have mercy on me, O Lord. After he knows his sin, he says, God, have mercy on me. But I want to read verses 11 to 17 of Psalm 51. Pay attention to the difference of the attitude. When he knows his sin, verse 11, he says, Cast me not away from your presence. Whereas Cain walked away from the presence of God. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. When I come to God with a heart of remorse, I will impact the next generation. And sinners will return to you. Deliver me from the blood guiltiness. Oh God, oh God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering, the sacrifice of God or the pleasing sacrifice to God or a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. So if today I feel remorse in my heart, that my worship has not been wholehearted. The God of all creation will forgive you and change your destiny. Cain's destiny was a generation destroyed in the flood. King David's destiny led to Jesus, the salvation of humanity. The same thing is true for us. If today you turn away from your deceitful, half-hearted worship, God will give you a chance. In a moment, we're going to participate in communion. As we participate in communion, you know, the psalmist says, the psalmist says in Psalm 95 verse 6, he says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God and maker. Which means that this is an act of, a time of us coming to God wholeheartedly to offer Him our worship. So what I want to ask you, and you don't have to listen to me, but what I want to ask you is, before we participate in communion, our band is going to lead us through a couple verses of a song. Would you sit down, maybe with your heads bowed down, and examine the depth of your hearts and ask yourself, am I offering God my best? And if you're not offering him your best, would you today turn away from what you're not giving him? And would you start offering and surrendering to him your whole heart? 
as they lead us in a song, I'll come back up in a couple of moments. And we're going to take communion together. But would you prepare your hearts to see whether you are giving God your best or not? us some of the reasons as to why we partake the elements and one of the greatest reasons as to why we do this is because we were unable to pay for our own sins and knowing that our Heavenly Father did not withhold his best he gave us his one and only son the perfect lamb to be offered as a sacrifice for our sins and if God did not withhold his best from you how could you not give him your best so as we partake in these elements this is a sacred moment for those of us who believe in Jesus this is for those who call upon him as our God and our Savior so if you don't believe in him don't partake but the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11, Apostle Paul writes, says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take and eat to remember God's sacrifice. The same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes take and drink what we just did is an act of acknowledgement that God I want to give you my best because you gave me your best so I want to ask you again are you offering the Lord your best because if not today God is giving you a second chance to turn away to leave a legacy that would change the generations to come to leave a legacy that the generations in the future would see and say no, my parents, my grandparents, they indeed believed in the Lord. They came with all of their hearts. They knelt before the Lord. They worshipped Him. And because of who they were, I want to believe. 
that's the opportunity that God is giving you today. In a moment, I'm going to pray for us. As I pray, our worship, our, our prayer warriors are going to come forward. If you're in a place in your life where you know your worship has been half-hearted and you just need somebody to touch you and to bless you, come pray with somebody. If you're in a place in your life, you're just dealing with the struggles of life and you just need somebody to pray for you, come pray. Remember what the verse said, the psalmist says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the God, our, our God, our maker. If God leads you to come kneel before Him, come kneel this morning as an act of worship up here at your seats or raise your hands or bow your heads. Give this moment to your maker and worship Him. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we give you our adoration and worship that when we were unable to reach holiness and salvation, that you did not withhold your son from us. That you gave your son as an offering sacrifice for our sins, that each and every one of us who would call upon his name, we would have hope, we would have redemption, and we would experience the glory of our maker. And God, I, I pray for forgiveness. Forgive us for all the times where our worship has been half-hearted where we have come and sat down and acted like we are worshiping you, but inwardly we know that there is wickedness in us. And we are unwilling to even give you our sins. Forgive us for that, Lord. And today, instill in us a desire to bring to you all that we are, everything about us, and to offer it to you, Jesus. Our sins, our failures, the good things we have done to give it all to you and say, God, would you transform me from the inside out? And would you send me out as one who wholeheartedly represents the image of Christ? Jesus, be magnified in our lives. In your holy and precious name I pray. Amen.